Today, what I, what I would like to talk about is a little bit of Python's journey to data science. You know, a lot of people today think of Python as a data science language. And it's not always been that way. And I want to talk a little bit about how we've gotten to where we are right now, and then give a little bit of a sort of survey of, of where Python is now in the data science space. So any of you out there who are hoping to get started kind of have a roadmap of, of where to start. Um, first, a, a little bit about me. My name is Jake. Um, Jake VDP, you can find me on GitHub or Twitter or Stack Overflow or other places like that. Um, and, and my path has been a, a, an interesting one. I started studying physics, which led me to studying astronomy, which led me to analyzing large data sets and getting into data science and Python. And eventually that led me into software engineering because I realized the, uh, the, the real core of data science is good software engineering. And so currently, after, after all this stuff, I'm working now as a software engineer at Google, and it's been a, a really interesting experience. And I can, if, you, if you're curious about that, I can chat with you afterwards. Um, in the Python world, I've done a, a lot of things. I've, I've been working on a lot of different open source projects over the years. Um, including SciPy, um, Altair, Scikit-Learn, AstroPy, and I have a couple books that um, some of you might have seen before, the Python Data Science Handbook, and um, if you're into kind of like uh, r real sort of astrophysical data analysis, you can check out this. We have this graduate text in astronomy data processing. Um, so lots of fun stuff. But so I want to start out by saying, as I mentioned, Python has come a long way to where it is now as a data science language. And, and it started, as the way it started out, Python was not designed to be a data science language. And you see kind of vestiges of this um, sometimes when you approach Python asking data science questions. So for example, if you say, I want to visualize some data, and um, you go out in the world and ask various you know, tools how to do that. It, if you ask someone from the R community, they'll say, you visualize data with ggplot, right? Has, has anybody used R and ggplot? A few people out there. It's a phenomenal tool. It's a phenomenal tool for data analysis, data visualization, data science. Um, by, by comparison, if you ask Python um, if, how to visualize some data, you say, this says, OK, you should use matplotlib. Oh, you know, unless you want to do some interactive data, then it's Altair. Or you can use Plotly, or you can use C Seaborn's good for data science, and you can use Bokeh for other visualization stuff, and oh, Hall of Views is this new thing. You know, there, there's all these different answers to the same question. How do you visualize data? Um, and all these different packages and approaches people have developed. And this is, this is sometimes a little bit infuriating, and especially if you look at this thing, the, the zen of Python. Has, has anyone ever typed import this in a Python interpreter? You get this nice zen of Python, all these sort of rules that you can meditate about to make your Python as effective as possible. And one of them is there should be one and preferably only one obvious way to do things. And the, in the data science world, this is just not the case, right? I, I show the visualization here, but also um, storing data, you can use NumPy or Pandas or, or X-Array or TensorFlow Arrays or PyTorch. There's all these different ways to do things and it's a little bit infuriating when you're, you're getting started. You say, you know, how, why, why is Python this way? And what it, what it comes down to, why, why can't there just be one way? It comes down to the fact that, that Python didn't start as a data science tool. It wasn't designed as a data science tool or even a numerical or statistical computing tool at all. And, you know, if you rewind the clock almost 30 years and go back to the beginning, um, actually, we're, we're getting close to 40 years now, huh? Um, you go back to the beginning of Python. This is Guido Van Rossum, and um, he created Python um, basically as a teaching language and also to bridge the gap between the shell and C. And you look at, look at what Python was in the early years, and it, it basically was designed to be kind of an alternative to bash coding. It was, it was like a friendlier way to stitch together the different things you were doing in your computer. And, and Guido gave um, an interview a while ago where he talked about his expectations in developing Python. And he said, you know, I thought we'd write small Python programs, maybe 10 lines, maybe 50, maybe 500 lines, and that would be a big one. Um, 
And you compare that to where we are today, where the top companies around the world have millions of lines of Python driving their products in everything from data analysis to finance to, um, to fields in between. Um, so how, how did we go from that, almost 40 years ago, thinking Python scripts were going to be a dozen lines at the most, to where we are today, where Python is this, is this data science powerhouse, where 1,600 people gather in Chennai, India, to talk about how they're using Python in their work. Right? It's, it's an amazing story. And, and I, I sort of like, I like to trace this back um, through a few, a few different decades and kind of organizing it into a few eras. And, and I'm going uh, to pick on Dave Beasley right now. He's one of the later keynote speakers. Uh, but I thought I'd, I'd, I'd stick him up here, his, his picture up here right now. So in, in the 90s, uh, I think of Python in the 90s as like being in the scripting era. And Python was sort of this alternative to Bash. You know, people wanted to write Bash programs to stitch together different workflows they were using. And Python was just a nicer program to use. And, and if, you, if you read what uh, Dave wrote back um, 19 years ago in, in, this, in this paper in Scientific Computing with Python, he said, you know, scientists work with a wide variety of systems ranging from simulation codes to data analysis packages to databases and visualization tools and homegrown software, each of which presents the user with a different set of interfaces and file formats. As a result, a scientist may spend considerable amounts of time simply trying to get all these components to work together in some manner. And um, Dave and others during that time really pushed Python as a solution to do this kind of gluing of different processes together. And some, some interesting um, code from that time is, uh, an example is, is the simplified wrapper and interface generator, SWIG. And basically what SWIG did was it, uh, it gave you this really nice interface to kind of take your C code or your other compiled code and generate Python interfaces so you could use them more interactively and more, um, more intuitively. And this really helped pave the way for all the sorts of things that came later and all the tools that you use today. So that was a scripting era in the, in the 90s. Python is an alternative to Bash. In, in the 2000s, I like to think about that as the SciPy era. So the, if, if the SciPy era had a motto, it would be uh, Python is an alternative to MATLAB. You know, MATLAB is this, is this powerful system that a, a lot of scientists and engineer, engineers have used and still use to do data analysis, data visualization, and things like this. And in the, in the early 2000s, uh, a lot of people were pretty jazzed about, about Python as a tool for gluing together their data analysis workflows and said, hey, you know, why, why can't we use Python for the kind of things that we're using MATLAB for right now? And uh, w one person who was uh, instrumental in this is John Hunter. Um, and in 2012, uh, shortly before he passed away, he gave a keynote at SciPy where he talked about the, um, the history of the Matplotlib project, which is uh, the project that he created. And he said basically in the, before Matplotlib, he had a hodgepodge of work processes. He would have Perl scripts called C++ routines that would dump data files. He'd load them in the MATLAB. And after a while, he got tired of MATLAB and he tr started using Gnuplot instead. And he, he looked at this and said, you know, I want, I want Python tools that can take all these different pieces of my workflow and put them into one, one package. Um, similarly, Travis Oliphant, who created, um, co-created NumPy and SciPy with uh, some others in the community, he said, prior to Python, I used Perl for a year, then MATLAB, then shell scripts, and Fortran, C++ libraries. And when I discovered Python, I really liked the language, but it was very nascent and lacked lots of libraries. And I felt like I could add value to the world by connecting these low-level libraries together to high level usage in Python. So uh, again, the same story. He had all these different tools he was working with, and he wanted Python to glue them together and to be this kind of one workhorse that could do all these numerical things. Um, similarly, Fernando Perez, who you might know as the creator of the IPython and Jupyter projects. He was a, um, a quantum physicist at the time, and he said he remembers looking at his desk, seeing all the books of languages uh, stacked with books on C, C++, Unix utilities, Perl, IDL, Mathematica, Make, 
And um, I realized I was probably spending more time switching between languages than getting anything done. And this is what drove him to create the IPython project and to start using Python to stitch these workflows together. So if you look at the software that came out of uh, these three folks and all the folks around them that were working on the same things, these big, big software packages are, are matplotlib around 2002, scipy around 2000, um, I, I wrapped numpy into scipy there, and ipython around 2001. And, and I, I dug through the internet to find these like original logos for each of these packages. They're pretty awesome. I love the, I love the red on yellow of, of Matplotlib. It's a really, really good design choice. Um, but as, as time went on, um, actually, or originally, each of these packages had some components of, uh, that overlapped. They, they all had some component of visualization, some computational tools, some shell tools. And, and eventually, as, as these folks started talking to each other, um, they realized that they had some overlap and decided to start working together. And so that brought us to our, our modern situation, where we have Matplotlib, SciPy, IPython, um, which have distinct uh, use cases within the, within the scientific analysis stack. And they're all built on NumPy, which is this unified array library that goes underneath them all. So this is kind of like the 2000 to 2010. This sort of stuff kind of percolated out. And we ended up with a really nice stack where we could do in Python the kinds of things that scientists and engineers had been doing in MATLAB and, and, were doing, and are still doing in MATLAB. So yeah, so that's, that's the SciPy era. And if you look at the key conference series, the SciPy conferences were, um, were big in that, starting as, as sort of meetups for the people developing these tools to now where they are the, they're the core meetups for the, for the users of the scientific stack in Python. Okay, so we had the scripting era. That's kind of Python as an alternative to Bash. We have the SciPy era, Python as an alternative to MATLAB. And where are we in the last 10 years? The, I, I like to think of the last 10 years as the, as the Pi Data era. And if Pi Data has a, has a motto, it would be Python as an alternative to R. You know, R has really developed as, um, as, as a powerhouse of a tool for statistical analysis in particular, and for, um, for cleaning and analyzing and interpreting and visualizing data in particular. And um, a, lo a lot of folks in the Python world wanted a, wanted a Python alternative to R. You know, they really appreciated the beauty of Python and its syntax and didn't want to have to switch languages when they were doing this kind of data analysis. So um, I, I think what kind of kicked off the PyData era in a lot of ways was uh, Wes McKinney and his work on the Pandas package. And, and Pandas is interesting. You know, Wes was working at the time as a consultant in the financial sector, where a lot of people were using R and other tools of that flavor to do data analysis. And Wes was, again, one of these people who, who wanted to use Python. He loved the Python language and wanted to be able to use Python for those kinds of applications. So um, if you read in the, in the intro of his book, Python for Data Analysis, he has a, a really nice discussion of what, what led him to develop Pandas as a library for Python. And he said, I had, I had a distinct set of requirements that were not well addressed by any single tool at my disposal. Data structures with labeled axes, integrated time series functionality, arithmetic operations and reductions, flexible handling of missing data, merge and relational operations, and I wanted to do all these things in one place, preferably in a language well suited to general purpose software development. So again, you see this theme coming through. It's people who have workflows that involve multiple tools and saying, you know, Python is the tool I want to use for this, and figuring out how can I, how can I bring these workflows into Python in a way that will help me and help others. And so Wes created the Pandas package. Um, other key software developments at kind of at the, in the tw early 2010s were Scikit-Learn, which is a, a machine learning library that a lot of you are familiar with. Uh, Conda is this package manager that came around and solved a lot of the, the difficulties with packaging scientific software. The IPython Notebook and later the Jupyter Project um, 
provide a, a nice compute environment for um, for working on analyses and sharing them with your your coworkers and colleagues. And um, there was this key conference series, the Pi Data Conference, which has expanded to this this international uh, set of, of workshops and and meetings. And um, it's been really interesting to see it um, to see it grow. You know, the Pi Data Conference is very kind of close to my heart because it was my first uh, my first Python meeting. The first talk I gave at a Python meeting was at the first Pi Data workshop in March of 2012. I'd never been to a Python conference before that, and uh, because I'd been working on the Scikit-Learn project, they asked me to come talk about machine learning in Python. And um, it, was, it was the wildest thing. You know, I walked into this room, and there were all these, there were all these people who I'd heard of before, who I'd, I'd, I'd used their software. You know, Travis Oliphant was sitting over there, and Fernando Perez, and, and all, all these people that were like, you know, in, in my mind, there were these, these gods of the Python language. And then I was sitting in the room with them, and it turned out they're just normal people like me. Um, and, it, and it was so interesting to, to meet them and to get into that. And I've been, I've been enjoying the Python community ever since then. Um, so anyway, we have these, these three kind of eras of the Python language that were Python developed from this kind of alternative to bash, where you could write dozen line scripts, all the way into now where you can use Python as, a, as the full stack for scientific or, or scientific data analysis and related things. So um, if there's any theme that I want you to take from this, this survey, it's that you know, Python, people want to use Python because they think it's an intuitive, beautiful language. Um, and and people, people look to the, the tasks that they have to do and figure out how they can use Python for it. And that, that, that's why we're here today. It's because of all these individuals who decided they wanted to use Python, wanted to make the ecosystem better. Um, and so Python has incorporated all these lessons learned in other tools and communities. And it's what's, what makes Python the powerhouse that it is today. So, um, it's important then to recognize with this perspective that Python's not a data science language, right? But because of all these commitments over the years and all these contributions from people, it's become this, this general purpose language that can do data, data science well. Um, so the, one way I like to think about Python is it's sort of a Swiss army knife, right? You have, you have this one package with with lots of different tools in it. Uh, but uh, it, it's different than a normal Swiss Army knife because it's a, it's a Swiss Army knife that anybody can contribute to, right? And so, so you have lots and lots of different opportunities of different tools that you can use that are written in Python. But um, the, the strength of that is you have a huge capability, but the weakness is like, it's hard to know where to start, right? There's no, there's no top-down governing body saying that this is the new package that you should use for visualization. You have a half dozen people trying to solve their own visualization problems and putting tools out there for you to use. And um, it's really hard to, where, to know where to start when you want to do something in Python if you've, if you've, never, if you've never started with it. So um, the, the second half of the talk, now with this framework of you know, where we've come from, what I want to talk about now is, is where we are right now. And if you're someone who is looking at Python as a potential tool for data analysis or for your own work, you know, where should you start? And I want to give you a little bit of a roadmap of the types of tools that are out there and, and what you should look at as you, as you look into this. So first, you need to start by um, installing Python and installing various packages that you can use in it. Um, and, and I would recommend this, this Conda installer. Um, you know, Python packaging has come a long way in the last 10 years, but Conda was a real turning point in my experience where, you know, prior to 2012, um, I remember struggling for hours and hours to try to get tools like NumPy and SciPy to install on my system. Uh, you know, and I was using Linux where it was easy. You know, if you're using Windows, then forget about it. Has anyone ever tried compiling SciPy on Windows? It's like a, it's a, it's an experience I would not wish on my worst enemy. But um, fortunately, 
Fortunately, the, uh, the Conda team um, basically solved this in, in one swoop where they created this package manager called Conda. And it, it basically comes in two flavors. You have the mini Conda, which is basically the, the smallest thing you need to get started. It's Python plus the Conda installer, and you can start installing the packages you need. Or if you don't want to have to make decisions, you can install Anaconda, which is basically Miniconda plus the entire universe of useful Python packages. Um, so you install that, it's a few gigabytes, and you're, you're just ready to go. Uh, I usually start with Miniconda because it's more lightweight and you can, you can build up what you need. Um, and if you go to the Conda website, you can see there's Windows, Mac, and Linux versions, 64-bit and 32-bit, Python 2, Python 3. You can choose where you want to start. I'd say choose the Python 3 at this point. And, and once you download it, you install it, and you get a, get a nice little installer in your command line. And then you have this uh, two things installed. You have the Conda tool, which helps you install packages. You have Python itself, which lets you, you know, run Python code. And um, these are both, in, both executables that are installed by Conda. And now if you want to start installing packages, you say Conda install. NumPy, SciPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, Jupyter, and it will install them on your computer. It'll install pre-compiled binaries, whether you're on Linux or Mac or Windows, and it's just, uh, it's just slick and it works. So start with Conda and install those, those packages. You can also do more fancy things like create environments, like you can have a Python 2.7 environment next to your Python 3.7 environment with separate packages. It, it really makes the whole thing, uh, the whole thing nice. So when you activate this new environment, then you have uh, different Python versions, and you can, you can s actually run the Python command, and you're getting your new uh, Python binary there. So anyway, if you, if you, look, at my, if you look at my computer and, I, and you list all the environments, I tend to use Conda to basically separate all the different projects that I'm doing. I have um, Conda versions for all the major, uh, Conda environments for all the major Python versions. And then for the various thing, various tools that I'm working on, I have development environments for, say, AstroPy or SciPy or Scikit-Learn or Vega. And keeping these things separate means that when I, um, uh, say, when I, when I try something new in SciPy, I don't break the environment that I need to use to start analyzing my data for, for my other projects. So it's nice to sort of keep things separate. Conda is a good tool for this. Uh, and just as a little side note, there's also this tool called pip, which is for um, installing Python packages. And if you're curious about the difference between Conda and pip, um, it, it just briefly, pip is something that installs Python packages in any environment. And Conda is something that installs any package in a Conda environment, right? So, so Conda is a, a little more broad in that it can install things like Fortran tools that underlie your libraries. But um, pip is, a, is specific to Python, but it can, it can kind of work anywhere. So anyway, that, that's package managers for, for you, for getting started with Python. So, and now if you, once you have your packages installed, you need an environment to start coding in. And I, I often recommend people start with Jupyter or JupyterLab. So JupyterLab um, is, is basically, you can think about it as a front end in which you can um, develop your code, execute your code, um, and share it. So if you conda install JupyterLab and then run JupyterLab from the command line, you get this, this nice little web UI coming up. And what Jupyter does is it gives you a browser-based interface where you can start executing Python code. So you open a new notebook and you have this Jupyter notebook right here. You start entering code and uh, the cool thing about JupyterLab is that um, the, the outputs of the code are embedded right there in the notebook, including visualizations. You know, you don't have a separate window popping up, and you can kind of keep all your code, all your data, all your outputs in one place. And, and JupyterLab is a, is a really interesting and dynamic thing. It's the, the, 
it's, it's built on the Jupyter Notebook, which has been around for about seven years now in one form or another. But JupyterLab itself is, is a more full-featured IDE, uh, a full-featured um, interactive development environment where you can, you can edit text files, you can edit notebooks, you can view images, you can view various file types. And it, it gives you a really flexible way to start exploring the, the Python ecosystem. So that, that's the coding environment. And, um, and something that's, that's based on the Jupyter system and, and built on top of that, which is really interesting, is this project called Binder. And you can think of Binder as a way to take your Jupyter notebooks and your Jupyter Lab projects that are stored on a place like GitHub and, um, and open them and view them live without having to do anything on your own computer. Um, it's, it's a way of kind of like tur turning your Git, Git repo into something that you or the users or, or your, your collaborators can execute um, and, and work with interactively. So for example, uh, my Python data science handbook, I have this, this launch binder button. And um, all the content of the book is on GitHub in the form of Jupyter Notebooks. And with Binder, what this means is you can, you can launch it and you have um, the interactive notebooks there to start executing code and exploring the code and modifying things and seeing what you can do without having to run anything on your own computer. So it's a, it's a really cool system that's been developed by, by the Jupyter folks. Um, I should also mention, uh, uh, a similar, in some ways, similar thing is this project called Google Colab. This has been the project that I've worked on at Google in the last year or so. Um, and it's basically a Jupyter notebook on top of Google's computing infrastructure and backed by Google Drive. So if you use Google Docs um, to, to store your files, um, Colab is basically a way to store your Jupyter notebooks on Google Drive and to execute them in the cloud all for free. And, and a, a nice thing about it is it's, it's zero setup, you can share with people, and you have free access to hardware like GPUs and TPUs that let you do powerful computing without having to invest in, you know, invest in your own computer and the, the amount of uh, uh, money and time it takes to, to get something like that set up locally. So um, from there, you know, we have the, our computing environment now, what if you want to do some numerical computation? The real uh, powerhouse behind most of Python's um, machine learning and data analysis packages is this package called NumPy. NumPy stands for numerical Python. You can conda install NumPy. And essentially, the core of what NumPy is is an ND array object. It's basically a, a very flexible container for your data. And um, you, can, you can define your data, and you can start doing arithmetic operations on your data. Like here we're taking the, the contents of this X array, multiplying it by two, and adding one, and we get um, the array out, this element-wise arithmetic. And, and notice that the, like, the loops and, and the, the handling of, of memory th and things like that here are implicit. Um, So with, with NumPy, you can do a lot of different numerical computation. For example, linear algebra is built in. If you want to do something like a singular value decomposition, this is a, a fundamental operation that underlies a lot of machine learning algorithms. Um, you, you can do that in one line in NumPy. And um, if you look into more high-level tools like scikit-learn, um, scikit-learn is using NumPy's linear algebra tools under the hood to provide you an API to do machine learning in a very convenient manner. You can do other things like uh, fast Fourier transforms and a lot of the, the core um, routines that underlie data analysis. So the, the key to using NumPy effectively, if you, if you start digging into this, is something known as vectorization. Um, so if, if you come from a language like C or Java or Fortran, you might be used to doing these kind of things by hand. You know, you have an array of data and you say, I want to, I want to operate on each value in this array. You might be tempted to, to write a for loop where you take the, you take a, define an array for the result, you loop through each value, you assign the, you operate on each value and assign it to the output. But if you time this in Python, this for, for what is this, 10 million values, 
takes about six seconds, which is really phenomenally slow in the age of, uh, of modern CPUs, right? Python, when you start looping over data and doing repeated operations, Python is really, really slow. But when you use uh, tools like NumPy, you get, um, by, by using this vectorized approach, not only do you, do you avoid the, the need to write these for loops explicitly, but um, you get a 100x speed up just by writing, writing um, more intuitive code. And that's because what NumPy is doing is it's taking these operations and pushing them from the slow Python layer down into the compiled C layer under the hood. Um, so if you want to know more about this, I have a, a talk from PyCon 2015, and there's, there's also a lot of other uh, interesting um, resources online to learn more about vectorization and using NumPy effectively. So, so NumPy is good for kind of raw data sets, but if, in the real world, data has labels, right? Um, you have, and, and often you don't want to access your data by index, you want to access your data by the, the labels of the columns. And this is where, where pandas comes in. Pandas, the name comes from panel data, and it's basically an answer to R's data frame within the, within the Python world. And what, what pandas gives you is kind of a wrapper around NumPy's functionality that lets you access sections of your data by name rather than by index. So you create a data frame with a, with a column named X and a column named Y, and you can start um, manipulating these data, these pieces of data by name. So create a new column that's called x plus 2y and just do, do what comes natural and do the column plus 2 times the other column and, and it creates the data frame for you. Panda's other real strength is reading um, serialized data files like CSV. NumPy has some tools for this, but they're not nearly as mature or user-friendly as the Pandas versions. So you can read data in one line from a CSV file or a JSON file or a database or, a, or any other data source. And then once you have the data, you can start doing um, fast SQL-like grouping and aggregation and the other, the other types of, um, uh, uh, of uh, algorithms that, that really go, that, that go into a more complicated data analysis. So we can group by the ID and take the sum, and we see here that, um, I gotta make my tools go away, the sum, sum of all the A values is four and the sum of all the B values is six. This might seem small, but, but having this kind of um, functionality in a, in a very efficient manner is, is huge, and there's not really any easy way to, to do this in NumPy by itself. Okay, so you have your data analysis, NumPy and Pandas, and now you want to visualize it. Um, Matplotlib is this core visualization tool that's been used for, for almost 20 years now. And um, to, to give you an idea of how pervasive Matplotlib is, in my PhD work in astronomy, basically every research paper I ever published had all matplotlib plots. I never used any other visualization tool to create plots in my papers. So, so matplotlib is really powerful and lets you do, do a lot of amazing things. You can create pretty much any figure in any visualization with matplotlib. So what it, what it looks like is this, is um, you have a plot function and you pass in two arrays and it gives you the output. So here's plotting a sine and a cosine. Um, but these days, there's a, there's a lot of things that, that people want to do that Matplotlib can't do. And a, the biggest example of that is uh, interactive visualization on the web. So if you click on a website and you see an interactive chart where you're clicking and zooming and scrolling, Matplotlib can't really do that. So there's, there's been a number of packages that have come along that have tried to uh, address this need. Um, Oh, uh, be before I get into the interactive packages, the, the other thing that Matplotlib doesn't do very well is handle um, named data like in Pandas. So Pandas itself actually has a wrapper on Matplotlib that lets you plot data by name rather than by index. So if we take a data frame and we do plot.scatter and say we want to scatter the petal length versus the petal width, we get that scatter plot. And um, similarly, the Seaborn package has this uh, pair plot function and, and other functionality that lets you do more, um, lets you do more uh, specialized plotting in, in a few lines of code. 
uh, another, another package that's really interesting that builds on matplotlib is this one called plot9. And if, you, uh, if you're used to R's ggplot, plot9 is a really nice answer to that. It basically gives you the ggplot API within Python and outputs matplotlib plots. So you can do things like define the aesthetic, define the geometry, whoops, define the statistics and the kinds of facet you want. And if you're an R user, this should look really familiar. You get this sort of grammatical approach to plotting, that, um, but you get it with matplotlib. So yeah, a lot of tools built on matplotlib. And then, and then going into this more like web visual, interactive visualization stuff, there's a, a tool called Bokeh. And Bokeh's strengths are that it's really good at analyzing large data sets um, in, a, in an interactive in-browser manner. Um, you can do lots, lots of different things. So you can, you can check this out. Another tool, um, there's a company, a startup called Plotly that has a, a tool called Plotly that, that does, is similar in spirit. It lets you do a lot of di interesting kind of interactive and dynamic visualization um, from Python. And one thing that Plotly does really well is it has uh, tools for animations. So if you, if you want to create animations within your browser, in Python, Plotly is a good tool for you. And then um, a, a tool that I've been working on is, uh, th this has been my project, my open source project for the last couple of years is called Altair. And basically this is, what we wanted to do with Altair is provide a, a, a grammar based approach to plotting, similar in spirit to ggplot, but based on a, a somewhat different grammar of graphics that lets you kind of more intuitively define complicated interactive visualizations from Python. And Altair lets you do, lets you do a lot of interesting things like linking plots across each other. Um, so you, can, you interact with one plot and it, it, it um, updates the other plots and things like this, and, and all of this in a, in a very compact, uh, sensical API. So if you're interested in that, I have some talks online that you can look at, or you can look at the, um, the Altair tutorial or, or other Altair resources online. And I'm happy to chat about that a little bit with you afterwards. Um, so if you want to kind of make sense of it all and you don't know where to start in the visualization world, there's this cool website called PyViz, which is essentially an effort to, uh, to organize this information about visualization. Um, and, uh, um, okay, so, so some interesting things that have happened recently in this space are um, something for, for dashboarding. There's this project called Panel that's come out recently. And um, what, what this lets you do is use Python to, uh, to, to quickly define interactive dashboards with callbacks to the Python kernel that you can even post on websites um, and, and let you know, kind of users see without having, to, without having them, them having to run the code themselves. So this is an example. If you take, if you take an Altair chart, uh, this is a simple, uh, basically a function that makes a chart given a stock symbol. So we, we get the stock data and we choose that symbol from there and we chart, mark line, and encode the date versus the price. And so if we plot Apple here from this data, we see Apple's stock chart there. And what panel lets you do is it lets you take this function, this make chart function, and pass it to a method that creates an interactive version of it and then um, embeds that in an output display. And um, it, gives you, it gives you a little widget that lets you, lets you choose the input value, lets the user choose the input value, and then have the result be reflected right there. And the key to this is that this function, this make chart function, can do anything. You know, this could be, this could run a machine learning model or fit some sort of, some sort of sophisticated process to your data. And if you look at the panel website, they have examples of this where this is live on the internet. You click on the example and you get a version of this that you can just, you can just look at. And it's, you know, it's, it's a dozen lines of Python code and it makes, the, it makes creating kind of interactive browser-based explorations of data a very uh, intuitive and, and easy thing to do. 
So it's a, it's a cool project, and like I say, this is relatively new. I ju I've just heard about this in the last maybe six months. And it's out from the same people who created Anaconda and Bokeh and some of those other projects. So, so check it out, take a look at that. It's, a, it's fun to look at. Okay, so we have our uh, computing platform in Jupyter. We have our, our, we have our numerical data analysis libraries. We have our visualization. What if you want to go a little bit beyond that and start doing some more sophisticated analysis? So SciPy is the, the tool that you want for that. And this has been, uh, like I mentioned, this has been used for about the past 20 years. Um, as a tool for doing scientific analysis in Python. And it has a whole host of interesting functionality. You know, a lot of the, when I was doing, when I was developing new algorithms to analyze astrophysical data, a lot of the approaches that I used were straight out of SciPy. Because it has things for sparse matrix, um, interpolation of data, numerical integration, um, spatial metrics, statistical functions, optimization, linear algebra, mathematical functions. If you're, if you're a physicist and you, you like your Bessel functions, you can compute your Bessel functions with SciPy. Um, related trans, uh, Fourier, transform, Fourier transforms and similar things. So anything you want to do in Python, um, you, can, you can basically do with SciPy. And an example of this, here's a, a few lines of code where we create, a, um, we, we create an X grid, we minimize the first order Bessel function over that X, we plot the result, and we plot the, the, minimum play, uh, the, the minimum point in that result right here. So this red point right here is the minimum that we found based on this optimize.minimize. So a few lines of code, and you're able to do these things that, um, you know, if you're, right, if you're used to being a, an old school scientific coder doing this by hand, this would be a lot of lines of Fortran. But you can do it in, um, in just a few lines of Python. And that's really the power of Python for, for data analysis. If you want to go a little bit beyond that and, and do machine learning, you can, you can use this package called scikit-learn. And essentially what scikit-learn does is it takes NumPy and SciPy and all the tools, the lower level tools available in there, and gives you a high level API for machine learning. So here's an example. If we create an, an array of random X points, we compute a function, y is sine x plus some noise. And we plot it, we get, we get some data that looks like this. Now how might you find, kind of smooth this data and find the line of best fit in there? With, with scikit-learn, it's a, it's a few lines of code. We can use basic, we can use something like a random forest regressor. This is just one example of a machine learning algorithm that's available. Um, and once you, have your, once you have your model that you create, you can fit it to your data. So we're going to fit it to our x data and our y data. This little colon new axis thing is just to basically take the data from a row array and turn it into a column array. And then we can compute the grid on which we want to fit it. And then we predict on this grid and figure out what the y values are, and we plot the results Plot, plot the data and plot the fit on top of it. So this is, this is what a, a simple random forest model gives for this data set. And, and the power of scikit-learn is that the API is regular enough that if you want to use a different model, like a support vector machine regressor, you just drop in a different model and look, the, the rest of the code stays exactly the same. It's just the, the Python class we use that defines which model you're going to use. And you can see that the support vector machine has, a, has different characteristics. It doesn't, it doesn't conform as closely to the individual data points. It does a little more, more kind of smoothing. And um, as you dig in and learn more about these machine learning models, you can get an intuition for, for which one is better depending on what you want to do with your data and your model. So scikit-learn is a really cool um, package for that. And this is something that the scikit-learn was sort of the way that I got into the Python open source world as I started contributing to this package in about 10 years ago, 2009. Um, and it's been a, been a cool thing to be involved with. So um, we have all this numerical analysis, scipy, scikit-learn. We're starting to build up a really interesting tool set. What if you want to start moving to larger data sets? Um, there's this great tool called Dask um, that 
that, that a number of people, I've, I've already talked to a few people today who are using this in their, their own work. What Dask does is it, it basically provides uh, a Python API around massively parallel execution of code. Um, and the cool thing about this, uh, this API is that it, it lets you do things without, without having to worry about the details yourself. So a uh, typical data manipulation with NumPy. We have an, an array, we multiply it by four, we take the minimum and we print the result, something like that. The same thing in Dask is basically the same code except we import Dask array and we create our array, we multiply it by four, we take the minimum and we print the result. And in this case though, the result is not a number. This, this result is an abstract representation of the calculations that you just did. And uh, there are ways to visualize what this representation is. And basically you're taking your, your array, you're splitting it into five chunks, you're creating arrays for the, both of those, you're multiplying each chunk by four, um, then you're taking the minimum of that chunk, and then you're combining all these chunks together, taking the minimum of each, and you get the minimum value, right? So that way, instead of doing all these multiplications and minimums on one process in one core, you're splitting it among multiple processes. So this is a little silly for multiplying an array by four and taking the minimum, but you can imagine how this generalizes to more, um, more sophisticated operations. And what it means is that you can, you can call compute on this task graph and get the result. And the power of this approach is that this task graph, this abstract representation of what you're trying to do with your data, can be sent out to um, an AWS cluster. It can be sent to uh, a GPU on your machine. It can be sent to uh, a Condor cluster of all the desktop machines in your academic department, if you have something like that. Um, it's, it's a really flexible way to, to describe the problems you're doing and to evaluate them. So uh, another sort of code optimization thing that, that you might have come across in the Python world is Numba. This is a really cool package and, and basically what it is, does is it tries to take Python code and compile it down into fast LLVM code without much extra work. So a, a typical example, you know, everyone likes their Fibonacci numbers. So here's, here's a Fibonacci number calculator in Python. And to compute the 10,000th Fibonacci number using this sort of loop-based approach is, is two milliseconds per loop. So you might think that's, that's sort of fast, but it's, you know, it's, it's sort of slow. If you, if you do the, the equivalent in a compiled language like Fortran or C, it's going to be a lot faster. What Numba lets you do is add a decorator to this function. Look, I haven't changed anything except for adding this decorator. And you get a 500x speed up in these sort of loop-based approaches to, to analyzing or to, to working with data. Um, what this is actually doing is it's taking the bytecode in this defined function, compiling it to LLVM, which is sort of like a, like a compiled fast language, compiling it to LV, LLVM, compiling that and then executing the compiled code rather than the Python code and dropping in the result for you. So there's been some really interesting things done with Numba to, to kind of speed up more sophisticated analysis and particularly in, in image manipulation and things like this. Um, so, so check that out if you're interested in like how to make your Python code faster. Um, so uh, another one I, I should mention real quickly is, um, is uh, Cython. So Cython is sort of a, a way to marry C and Python. And um, it's similarly, if you take this Fibonacci number generator, what Cython does is it allows you to compile your Python code into C rather than to LLVM. And for example, if you, if you just run this basic Python code through the Cython interpreter, you get a 10% speed up. You know, it's not, not that much. But where, where you can really start taking advantage of things in Cython is if you kind of combine the idioms of Python and C into one script, and you start defining typed variables inside your, your Cython code. Then you get the same 500x speed up as, as Numba, just by kind of like compiling into optimized code. And I often say that Cython is my favorite language to program in, because it's like, it's got all the beauty of Python and all the expressibility of C. 
And um, so I really enjoy writing code in Cython because it lets you do some, uh, some interesting things. And Cython is really a powerhouse behind all the tools that you're using in the Python data science world. You know, NumPy, SciPy, Pandas, Scikit-learn, AstroPy, SymPy, Pan, um, uh, and a lot more are, are using Cython at their core to make the, the tools you use fast. So uh, there's so much more out there that I haven't talked about. I, I just wanted to basically give you a, a brief survey of, of the core tools that if you're jumping into Python data science that you, you should get familiar with. If you look at all the tools that have been built on top of these, there's, there's a ton from all different domains and all different fields, whether you're working in, uh, in neuroimaging or astronomy or, uh, or biology or anywhere in between. People are out there writing Python code and making Python tools to do the kind of workflows that, uh, that they have. And so as, we, uh, as, I, as I finish this, I want to remind you that you should not think of Python as a data science language, because that's not what it was created to be. It was created to be a language that's easy to use, a, a language that's expressible, and a language that's beautiful and fun to code in. And um, this, this is probably its greatest strength, right? Because Python is such a great language to use, people invest time into making it work for their own use cases. You know, Pyth Python is successful because people just like you used it to solve their problems and shared their solutions with the world. Um, and this is, this is kind of what I want to leave you with. Uh, you know, the 90s, I talked about Python being the scripting era. 2000s was the SciPy era. 2010s is the Pi data era. We're coming into another decade. Um, and wh where Python goes from here is up to the people who use it, up to the people who build these tools that other people are using. So, you know, it's, it's up to you. Any, any of you can kind of decide and influence where Python goes as we move forward in this next decade. And I, for one, I'm, I'm interested to see where, what comes out and, and where it all goes. So thanks very much. Here's my, my information. And I'd love to take some questions. Uh, so uh, you talked about the next generation, right? Like from, so what do you think where Python will be? Is it HPC, high performance computing, or making fa uh, Python more faster? Yeah, I don't know. It's hard hard to say where where Python will be in ten years. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if anyone would would have predicted ten years ago where we are now with Python being the kind of the core algorithm core tool for deep learning and things like that. What I really hope, I really hope is that Python can become more of a tool for the web. You know, JavaScript is taking over because it's, um, because everybody, everybody has a JavaScript interpreter on their phone or in their computer or on their watch even. Um, and, and I'd love for Python to kind of make headway into the world of, of the web and the browser. Um, so. I don't know if I'm predicting that'll happen, but I, I hope that happens. <laughs> Still, uh, we see Python in the field of web development uh, generally, but uh, uh, we have Fortran from last 20, 30, uh, 20 years, but we don't see Python there in HPC. Okay, the next so, question I, here. I didn't catch that, I'm sorry. Hello? Yeah, next question over here. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Hello, yeah. Th thanks a lot for your t uh, talk, uh, Jake. It was really nice knowing the roadmap and uh, how can we proceed. So uh, I am intrigued by the uh, tool that particularly that you work on, is that Altera that you were talking about. And from what I understood, it's a kind of a visualization tool. So my question to you is, well, while you are working on it and designing on it, are we also looking at it from the universal design principle? For example, me being a visually impaired person, I cannot access uh, these graphs by just looking at the screen. So are we also trying to build that functionality in these application and things? We have uh, some insight into this as well at, in our talk at around 11, but I would, I would like to know your new, uh, views on that. Yeah, th yeah, thank you for that question. Um, th that's, a, that's a really good point that we um, need to figure out how to, how to build sort of broad accessibility into our, into our tools and into our analysis. Um, 
Uh, one thing I will say with the, with the Altair project that I'm working on, um, we've, we've thought a, a bit about that, and one of the strengths there is that any plot generated um, with the Altair project also has kind of a full description and, of the plot and all the data embedded with it. So there's some work on the, on the Vega Light library which underlies it to um, <clears throat> add more accessibility tools onto the Vega Light chart display. And, uh, and I'm excited about that because it means that you know, the, the visualization is no longer just a grid of pixels on a screen, but it's uh, the data set and a full description of the data set in uh, a, a gr in a, in a grammar of visualization that that offers a lot of opportunities to to make these more more accessible. So it, it's a good reminder, though. Thanks for the question. Uh, hi, Jake. Uh, it was a wonderful talk. Uh, I <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask about number. So. Mm -hmm. uh, why should we, uh, why can't we just always use Namba? What are the kind of best practices, practices to use Namba? And in what situations uh, Namba won't be able to uh, cause a major speed up? Yeah, I'd say for, for Namba and Cython both, the times that you want to use them is when you find yourself writing big loops in Python and looping over data. Um, if you can, if there are things that you can't express in terms of NumPy vectorization primitives, then, then Numba and Cython are the way to go. Uh, so essentially, like, four loops in Python are slow, and you need to, a way to speed them up. So, yeah, uh, so this, I think this is going to be the last question. So last taker. Last question? Yeah. Where is OK. Yeah, so like you said that Python kept evolving with data science. Uh, I'd actually like to ask a question about quantum computation, which I'm working on currently, and how CERC and QuizKit and everything is just coming onto that. How do you think Python's going to evolve on those kind of future technologies? Yeah, quantum computation, that's a good question. I, lo looking at the past and how we've gotten here, I, I imagine that Python will start, you know, pe people will have kind of ways to call their quantum routines or more sophisticated routines, and Python will start as glue to call those. You know, rather than writing a bash script, you'll write a Python script. And then maybe after a while, someone will come up with a higher level API that can wrap that. And you know, maybe eventually you'll be writing your, your quantum computation scripts in Python with, uh, with built on quantpy or whatever, uh, whatever package you end up writing for all of us to use. <laughs> Um, so thanks very much. I'm going to be around for today and tomorrow, and I'm happy to chat and uh, answer any other questions you have. I appreciate your time. Thanks. <laughs>